Welcome back to the Health Innovators to Watch Awards Podcast 2023. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Candace Carpenter, uh, co-chief uh, executive officer of the Boston Congress of Public Health. I'm joined by my colleague here. Hello, my name is um, Dr. Cersei LeCompte, co-CEO of BCPH. Um, wonderful to be here today and looking forward to interviewing Dr. Johnson. Yes, Dr. Johnson. And I will briefly introduce you and then we'll give you a chance to, to do yourself justice because I know that's inevitably the case um, when it comes to these sort of things. But Dr. Karen Johnson is assistant professor at the University of Alabama at the School of Social Work. Um, she does a number um, of different research initiatives, um, but definitely focuses on black women um, and sexual risk behaviors. And some of the things that impact um, or really uh, affect those types of behaviors, such as trauma, racism, uh, stigma or oppression, and many other things as well. Um, and so I know, um, Dr. Johnson, you also look at uh, HIV um, and sexual transmitted infections uh, prevention, as well as reducing health disparities. Um, and uh, inequities related around transportation. So welcome so much to the show, Dr. Johnson. And tell us a little bit more about yourself and the favorite, uh, the, the things you're most passionate about. Well, thank you so much for um, this wonderful uh, honor and just time to talk with you about my research um, and uh, for the kind introduction. So things I'm most passionate about, I think you actually just read the whole list. Um, I love working with women um, and um, women with the complicated histories. Um, and the reason why that is um, perhaps one of my greatest passions is because it really reminds me of my um, my family, really. Um, what brought me to the work is um, um, my mom, who's no longer on earth, um, but um, during her life, she had a really tough go of it. Um, and as a child, I was really inspired by her story. Um, we immigrated to America when I was nine and um, prior to her arrival here as well as uh, beyond. It was a life that was incredibly complex but her resilience was just awe-inspiring. Um, even just last week I was talking to several of my siblings. We have a weekly family call <laughs> and we <laughs> talk often um, and we were saying how did mommy do it? Um, and so capturing the stories of women who have um, experienced incredible hardship um, and trying to get that story out um, because oftentimes as a social worker, a lot of the peer reviewed literature that I read um, as I was cutting my teeth on social work um, suggested that the, the picture was probably more dismal um, and maybe less resiliency or less um, uh, commitment to self and to healing um, and the story is quite different and as a result um, I was drawn to social work and the lives of these women. So I can talk to you a little bit more about my research. Um, I, um, as you said, my work looks at the intersection of HIV and uh, other sexually transmitted infections um, and the contextual factors that um, result in risk. Um, and I think of the contextual factors both in terms of place um, and geography, um, but also in terms of um, personal life histories, interpersonal uh, relationships, and how um, things like the organizations that women turn to for care um, may either support or impede their ability to um, access services and to uh, support them in their own efforts to be as safe as possible. No, oh, that's um, that's truly fascinating. I so appreciate you sharing that, and um, it really like speaks to how being a leader um, really is a very personal as well as academic and professional experience. How it comes from this personal place. Um, and I really love the idea that you have this family call every week to stay connected. Um, and you remember and honor the memory of the person who inspired you, your mother. And um, it really also speaks to how, um, as leaders, and I was wondering if you could speak to this, how we're never leaders alone. 
And um, I was just wondering just a little bit, just because you were talking about your personal experience, um, how that kind of support from your family, from your friends, from your colleagues helped um, bolster. Yeah. Um, so, yes, you we work in a community um, and the community can be so um, uh, instrumental in helping us to um, to move the work forward. And so um, what I find is um, first, I have had the privilege of working with just some of the best mentors on the planet. Um, and those mentors have really uh, come alongside me in, um, in kind of guiding my efforts. Um, I'm a part of the REITS team at Yale University right now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's an interdisciplinary team uh, with individuals from nursing and public health that come together um, and work with scholars like myself to provide a forum for not only discussion that is incredibly stimulating, but to challenge ourselves and think in very in ways that are uh, intersectional, like blending uh, nursing mm -hmm. and social work and public health and other disciplines together. Um, and certainly my mentors from Alabama, they've just been inspiring. Um, but I also have built a community of, of researchers that mm -hmm. are my peers. Um, and the community is quite intersectional. So some of my work, I work with um, engineers. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I know part of the work um, that we're talking about is how innovation informs my work. And so I'm always thinking of how the work can be informed by other disciplines as we are looking to solve. Um, a, there's a term that we use in social work, like wicked problems. Uh, we're looking to solve wicked problems. Um, and so engineering, um, education, public health, nursing, we need to come together to solve some of these more complex problems. That's amazing. It's amazing. Um, Candice, before I ask my next question, I wanted to, to give the floor to you and see like what your thoughts were and what yeah, questions no you problem. I apologize. I was kicked off. I don't know if you guys actually even saw that happen. So I guess No, you 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 went away. I, I didn't know mm -hmm. if um you had a connectivity issue for a moment or yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I, I, um, I think that wicked problems is a, a, a very critical one and, and something that I think um, extends into a number of different areas for sure. But I'd love to, if you could just expound upon that, um, Dr. Johnson, what are some of the wicked problems that you and this particular um, interdisciplinary team um, has worked on that you're most proud of, like any inroads that you guys have made? Yeah, yeah. Um, so even though the term HIV was coined around 40 years ago, part of what we know, um, there's still quite a few things to discover, but part of what we know is that in communities of color, um, mm -hmm. um, this problem continues to be wicked in terms of the rate of transmission is just disproportionately high. Um, we also know that um, um, in certain parts of the country, the, there's a disproportionate concentration of um, new transmissions. And the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health, um, and other um, uh, organizations that are dedicated both in the in terms of research and funding, you know, we've been coming together and trying to understand how do you make um, uh, even more uh, inroads into certain communities. So what we know is that um, reasons for continued transmission, not only for HIV, but for sexually transmission and uh, transmitted infections as a whole, um, is this complex blend of um, um, and I'm, let me just focus on uh, women living in the South for a moment, mm -hmm. but as you know, my work is also um, spreads to the Northeast, um, that in the South, um, social determinants of health um, is incredibly um, 
um, intractable um, mm -hmm. when you're living in parts of the country that are among the poorest parts of the entire nation and women don't have access to transportation. Um, they don't have access to Wi-Fi um, um, and the rate of policing is incredibly high and incarceration. Um, and when you have that coming together along with a um, um, an unpleasantly rich history of um, uh, race-based, um, not only policing, but race-based oppression, then that creates like a nexus, like a storm of risk for the population. And so some of what we've been looking at is um, number one, um, evidence-based interventions that are deemed highly efficacious um, by the Centers for Disease Control, for example, they've been in use in the Northeast for 10, 20 years and mm -hmm. never crossed, if forgive me, the Mason-Dixon line, right? And mm -hmm. so women living in um, some parts of the South, these interventions haven't reached them. Even though the interventions are um, incredibly effective in preventing HIV transmission and in preventing uh, and increasing other things like social support and lowering other risks like uh, intimate partner violence and substance use. Um, there's also, um, you might be familiar with it, um, a pill that, and now it can be delivered in other ways, including injections, that mm -hmm. if you take it um, um, preventatively, it can prevent transmission. Yeah. Um, women living in the um, South, none of them have heard of it. Not mm -hmm. even one. I have met with so many women during some conducting semi-structured interviews and there's just like an information gap and a divide. Um, and what we know at the same time is that these women are incredibly help seeking and help seeking. So one um, critical thing that I'm trying to do is to bridge that gap. So it's bridging information gaps. Um, it's also bridging um, um, issues related to social determinants of health, like lack of transportation and um, poverty, lack of awareness, education, and also systems that um, um, actively uh, at times work against the information sharing, work against um, um, providing the supports that women need to um, take care of themselves. That's really fascinating. And it just really speaks to the importance of the work that you're doing. And um, these, I, wor I work in the field of HIV as well. I've, um, so I really, what you're, what you're speak, what you're addressing, especially around that information gap is very, very familiar. Um, and also sometimes it can feel um, so frustrating because you work so hard every day and you're moving forward with your work. And um, I was just wondering, um, and I'm sure you have felt that way as well over time, how do you keep going? Um, what is your advice to someone who's in a similar position? Because you do such innovative work and you've been doing it for some time and you've been very successful, but obviously still work needs to be done. What do you say to someone who's just like, I'm just gonna throw in the towel? And how do you keep yourself from throwing in that towel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, such a great question. Um, I keep going, uh, well, one of the things that it's important to note about my story is that um, between um, my bachelor's and my uh, entering a doctoral program, I worked in uh, various um, social service agencies for 17 years. Um, and, you know, those wicked problems I was talking to you about, those were problems that I was facing every day. As first as a frontline practitioner, I was only a frontline practitioner for six months. I was promoted after six months. And I was like, Yes, sure, I'll be a supervisor, but I didn't have the training, but I had the um, the commitment to the work mm -hmm. um, um, because of the uh, reasons I mentioned before. Um, and so I had more questions than I had answers, I had more questions than I had skill. And so I just had like a thirst for knowledge and that thirst for knowledge kept me going not only in terms of the complex questions I was asking um, um, and 
knowing that there had to be better ways of doing it, right? Um, so that kept me going back to school and that keeps me going even now. Um, and so mm -hmm. one of the other things um, that's important about my work is that it blends uh, implementation science, which I'm sure you guys um, are familiar with, right? And the reason why implementation science is so critical for my work is because if all we do is focus on trying to deliver the direct services to whatever populations that we're serving, right? It's only a portion of the battle, right? Because, you know, you know that phrase, if you build it, will they come, right? The problem is you build it and there are so many barriers, right? That prevent, uh, first of all, let's talk about agency. Do women even have a uh, the ability to step forward. There are lots of issues that's happening, you know, on that individual level. But then, as I mentioned, interpersonally, then system wide. And so, my work, I'm like inspired and motivated to try mm -hmm. to figure out how to navigate and bridge gaps in terms of all those barriers. Because the truth is, it doesn't happen if you just build it in terms of the acquisition of the care and the knowledge, right? And so I'm inspired because um, um, I believe there are solutions there, right? And my work is, um, my commitment is to be um, responsibly disruptive, which might seem like an oxymoron, you know what I mean? Um, in terms of trying to figure out how to shift it so that women could be supported. Because I'm convinced, just like my mama, that women um, on the whole, right? And I'm talking about women, I could say the same as uh, in terms of men and, and, um, and young people, that they want to get care, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, and so my responsibility is to learn, listen, partner with them and with providers <laughs> um, and the systems to try to bridge those gaps. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And so, um, Dr. Karen, um, you mentioned a lot of really great things, implementation science being responsibly disruptive. Um, obviously, you know, Cersei and I are familiar with different with different terms. For the sake of the audience, could you break down, say, implementation mm -hmm. science? And when you talked about these things that contribute to if you build it, they might not come. Can we get very specific about what of those some of those things are? Absolutely. So implementation science um, is... Um, a scientific, forgive me for answering the, the question with the same word, but a scientific study of factors that promote and or um, um, limit um, the ability of organizations, and that could be within a single, single organizational setting or across settings, from taking um, adopting and delivering in ways that are sustainably delivered and delivered with fidelity, evidence-based practices and interventions. So um, an organization may, there might be different scenarios, right? If one scenario is an organization might not even want to um, adopt that practice. Why, right? If this practice is available um, and can provide life giving care um, um, to the population that organization is designed to serve, what is happening there. It could be an organization wants to adopt it, but there are factors within the organization, within the community, within the intervention itself that could, can create challenges. And so um, implementation scientists are trying to study all of those factors and then partner with every single population, right? The uh, end recipient of the, that care, the organizations from the senior most uh, level to um, the janitor and the, um, the front desk uh, clerk and those delivering the intervention to try to get the intervention into the organization um, across time, right? And I don't know if you've ever had the experience where um, as someone who is, um, on the in leadership right where you try to do something and then in a year two years three years are you even still doing it and if you're doing it is it looking the same way when you started out a couple of years ago and so implementation science studies all of that um and so in terms of some of the concrete things that can get in the way so i'll talk uh, about the the deep south in particular so 
I'm in Alabama, wonderful state. I've only been here for five years. And I got to tell you, I came from New York City. <clears throat> Um, and as I said, I was born outside of the country and I thought I was going to be so homesick. I wasn't. I felt mm. at home in Alabama almost immediately, um, surprisingly so. Not that I was, I didn't want to feel at home, but I just thought I would, the transition would have been jarring, but it wasn't, right? Mm. And so what I'm about to say, I preface it with that because I'm not denigrating this beautiful state. It is the most um, um, religious state in the entire nation or mm. in the top five. It sometimes trades places, right? Um, it is also the birthplace of the Confederacy. It's the birthplace of the civil rights movement. It's incredibly conservative, as we know, right? And so those things can create like a nexus of challenges that make implementation science um, incredibly important to study. I mean, it's important to study worldwide, right? But in a state like this, right? So things like um, opioid um, crisis, how do you get things like um, um, naloxone and other things into the hands of providers who may themselves feel for faith-based reasons, right? And for other reasons that we don't want to do that. Needle exchange programs, condoms, mm -hmm. um, external condoms, um, um, and even talking about same-sex relationships, like the state as a whole and agents of the state may intentionally and unwittingly oppose that right so mm -hmm. in the form of laws and policies so that's super macro level right um now how does that then translate to the organization right the, um the ceo of the organization executive director the head of the clinical practice does he or she or they right do they um consciously or unconsciously resist certain populations that they're serving, right? Um, um, even though the organization is built to serve that population. So implementation science is studying some of that stuff in terms of the external environment and how it's impacting um, the organization's ability to take on evidence-based interventions and practice and faithfully deliver them. It also um, studies things like the, um, the individual who is receiving the services who is that person and what are those intersecting things that make up their identity, right? Like, so for example, one of the things we know about COVID-19, um, outside of my work, but it's um, the analogy is still quite powerful, is that, um, you know, do you take the vaccine or do you not, right? Um, mm -hmm. And in certain communities, there was absolutely um, accurately um, stated issues related to trust or lack there mm -hmm. uh, right of the science of providers right and so things like implementation studies like me right and you and all of us like what are the things in the person who's supposed to receive the service in terms of his or her or their history right in terms mm -hmm. of their um history uh, said in a macro way but also my personal history that might cause me to take on this intervention i mean um participate fully or not in this intervention so those are just a couple of things implementation science that is studies other things which i'm more than happy to talk about but um those are some of the specific things that i need to um i confront not just need to confront right and i guess the last thing i'll say um is because of my 17 year history as a practitioner i come of it from a place of not vilifying the practitioner, right? Um, because sometimes, um, and I think that's just easy to do to say these, um, going back to my example, these, the clinical provider who's a born again Christian, like bad, bad, bad person, right? Mm -hmm. so, Part of the goal is just to try to understand what's happening, right? And engage them in conversations about what's happening, right? In order to navigate whatever those personal feelings are that that person might bring with them to the job and may not even be conscious of how that is alienating or authorizing the population um, and causing that intervention to be um, either wholly rejected or not delivered um, effectively. 
Wow, that that was very powerful. I, I love that you described that. And I myself am not an expert in implementation science, but that makes me want to run out and, you know, become more expert. Just everything that you describe, um, Dr. Johnson, sounds um, very fascinating. And especially when you said the context of Alabama, I really felt you brought it to life, describing, you know, the political context, um, mm -hmm. the, the really religious context. And you didn't mention it, but even the, the economic uh, context as well, given that Alabama is, is very economically distinct from many of the other states. Um, as well. So I think you, you made it very unique and, and, and just really highlight the importance that these things can, can change from state to state, you know, um, if, we're, if we're in the United States, um, you know, but context to context. So very powerful. Thank you. Yeah. You know, as a social worker, my work is also informed by the community. Um, and so when I talked about being responsibly disruptive, I wanted to kind of expand on that a bit because I think, um, again, for reasons that, um, sometimes for reasons that are very damning, right? So I'm not gonna always paint rosy pictures because it's not an accurate mm -hmm. description of the history of the work. Even social work itself, um, um, it has, um, uh, an ugly history as well, right, of coming um, to populations and telling the populations who they are and how the work will unfold um, and doing damage, right? And, um, you know, medicine itself, um, sometimes medicine has been quite ugly in terms of their care for populations that are um, economically um, um, disenfranchised and um, other, these intersecting, right, race and um, 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 ethnicity and uh, sexual orientation and the like. Um, um, but when social work is done well, <laughs> um, um, the blend of social work and implementation science, which I think um, not enough social workers are implementation sciences. So part of my goal is to change that. So I talk about it with my students and I'm developing a course right now for the University of Alabama on uh, implementation science for the School of Social Work. But when social work is done well, it um, and blended with implementation science, what it does, it it centers the voice of the um, recipient of the mm -hmm. service and also the practitioner of the service, right? Um, in ways that it's less about uh, research scientists with their gaze, right? Mm -hmm that sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes research across the years has done damage because we come along and we speak in ways that are whether um, I'm going to just say unintentionally um, um, patronizing or pathologizing mm -hmm. of risk and need and challenge. And so um, I believe very that this intersection of social work and implementation science is a critical intersection to make sure that the work is informed by those who are most impacted by it. And, and not just informed, but like guided. So for my um, one of my studies currently, the women that I serve, they are investigators in the study, right? Um, um, because they're, um, perspective is as critical as the head of the community-based organization that I'm working with as well. So there, we're all at the table. Yeah, I didn't know if you, if you wanted to jump in. Um, yes, I just, um, I wanted to, I was um, absolutely fascinated by, by everything you just said just now, because I really felt like you were touching on um, just the role of someone who in this work, how they could introduce social justice, um, you know, through ensuring that um, those who were being uh, impacted, as well as those who were worked um, in the science side, how the role of storytelling in that, and that everyone has a voice at the table. And then you just mentioned that you were doing a study where those who were part of it were also um, literally being leveraged as, as investigators and were being, um, given that role. And I was just, I was just wondering first, if you could talk a little bit about the importance of folks, um, being able to tell their stories and, and the intersections of their lives in social justice. And then this is separate, but, um, you're basically talking about community-based participatory action research, um, perhaps talking a little bit about that, um, how you leverage that um, 
and the power it has um, in making interventions like even more powerful. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and if I may, if I may jump in quickly, um, Dr. Oh, Johnson, yes. I want to piggyback on what um, Dr. Cersei said and, and say I absolutely agree the the, the making community members, uh, principal investigators, if you could also ensconce in your answer, um, how does that even work? I mean, what is the training needed and what is the, the ongoing support um, to be able to have them can, you know, start and, and complete something? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the um, partnering with communities, um, so for several years, I worked at Columbia University, my alma mater for my doctorate, uh, go Columbia, um, and uh, the School of Social Work in a group called the Social Intervention Group. And I'm still an affiliate with that amazing group, it's just amazing. Um, and one of the things that we did while there, um, doing much the same work, and actually the intervention that I'm working hard to implement in Alabama um, was created by my mentor, um, am I allowed to say names? Uh, Dr. Navila Elbasal at Columbia University School of Social Work. Um, and so one of the things that we did there was we had a, um, a uh, community advisory board. And the community advisory board consisted of uh, individuals who are currently involved in the um, criminal legal system and things like probation officers and people at the Department of Health and child um, uh, the administration for children's services, child welfare. And part of mm -hmm. what, uh, so my role was to um, work with others to convene this group, facilitate meetings um, and to support the individuals who are currently involved in the uh, criminal legal system um, to feel comfortable at that table. And part of what I noticed was that when I would meet with them one-to-one, -one, they had so much to say. It was so rich. It was so powerful. And then when we got to the table, complete silence, right? Um, and then I would debrief it with them, right? Um, and then they would say, and then we, the next time I'd say, okay, so what did you want to say? And they would kind of write down their notes and, you know, have um, a particular plan and intention of what they were good would say, again, we come back to the table, complete silence. And so part of what I did for this current study is to say, I'm reversing that process. <laughs> so it's going to be, and if I could accent myself in some ways, I would, right? Because I don't, I don't presume just because I look physically like them and I've come from, um, a difficult childhood that my story is identical, right? Um, but of course I need to be in the room. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so part of what I'm doing is for um, months and months, it's just us, right? All black women talking about what it means to be uh, a black woman in the state of Alabama. Um, um, while you're trying to get uh, care, um, navigating all these systems, like what are those things that are happening personally, interpersonally, system-wise, community-wise, that's getting in the way um, and um, having them, um, because the, the purpose of the intervention, just so you know, is to, um, for lack of a better word, southernize it, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, right? Because I didn't assume as I was coming that it would we would just take the same thing and just plop it down in the middle of Alabama or Mississippi or, you know, Georgia. Like, are there things culturally and contextually that need to be infused into the intervention just to make it resonate more, right? And so that's the project. We're rolling up our sleeves and we are talking about those things using various strategies um, um, that I've learned as a social worker on how to kind of lay it on the table while presenting Preserving, because this is a critical, important for mm -hmm. us as um, research scientists, those core elements of the intervention, right? That need to, no matter where you deliver it, if it's in Sweden or in Arkansas, right? That mm -hmm. those core elements must be in place. But how does the intervention need to look, feel, sound? How do we start the sessions? How do we end the sessions in ways that are more resonant? Um, because I, I think it, so um, it's important to note that while literature speaks to the fact that um, place matters, we haven't studied it enough, 
right? Like how is place mm -hmm. determinative of health, right? And so that's part of my work. So practically what I'm doing with the women is um, um, kind of sitting together and asking them um, to tell their stories as much as they're comfortable, right? Um, and we're going to have 10 meetings together where the women will look at the intervention. And as you were asking about the telling of the story, um, sometimes women are more comfortable telling the story of a friend, a sister, a daughter, a mother, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes women are more comfortable are, are comfortable telling their own stories. So as much as women want to give or not is what we want in service of the intervention. And I tell you the truth that in my um, 10 years uh, or so uh, as a student and then um, after I got my doctorate and studying, I find the women that I work with, and I think it would be accurate that to say that other researchers, if they were being joining this interview, would say the same, that when it comes to research, they are so motivated to help, right? So when mm -hmm. I say this thing can help others, they're like, oh, let me add it, <laughs> right? And so they will share their story, and it's quite powerful. So the intervention in question, um, we have actors who are... Um, and it's delivered through a multimedia platform in part, um, actors who have dramatized the stories of the women, mm -hmm. right? And um, we've asked women, these were women from the Northeast, did these stories sound right? Like help us to write these stories. And so their voices were infused in the story, right? What's believable mm -hmm. and what's not um, in ways that was most comfortable uh, for them. I feel like I might have missed uh, one or two of your questions as I was trying to answer, forgive me. Um, you're talking about social justice, right? Yes, and I just, you were you mentioned, um, and we were talking a little bit about the importance of folks being, you know, folks' voices being in the interventions, that they are integrated within the interventions that are supposed to be servicing their communities. And you mentioned just now that um, not only did they inform the creation of it, but they were able to give feedback to it. And, um, and I guess if you could talk a little bit about how that is a reflection of social justice in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, you know, there's a phrase in um, HIV uh, prevention work um, um, and in just social justice work uh, and community-based uh, participatory action research work, like nothing for us without us, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, while research um, and the science of research is critical, right, um, mm -hmm. it must take a back seat to nothing for us without us, right? And I think in... Um, to the extent that researchers and practitioners um, um, do that, it is about social justice, right? It's about, um, um, and language really matters, right? So not just I'm making the way for the voices, it's that I need to step back and the voice, the women step forward, like, you know, like, it, because it, even sometimes in the way we describe it, it sounds like the magnanimous researcher who mm -hmm. says, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to listen to your voices now, right? Like, it's like, we have to upend that. We have to reverse that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in the process of upending it and reversing it, right? Like, why is it that um, for women who know about pre-exposure prophylaxis, for example, why is it that so few of us, people look like myself, take it? Mm -hmm. There's a problem in research. The problem is not in the community, right? And I'm not saying mm -hmm. that the community doesn't have um, needs and challenges, right? But it's about how as researchers, you know, whatever our discipline or set of disciplines are, how we have done uh, unintentionally, for the most part, a disservice to the population. And that disservice is injustice, right? And social justice is about writing that because, uh, and that's not to say that women have to take PrEP, right? Or mm -hmm. women, or we have to take the vaccine, right? Like 
agency is critical <laughs> and it's at the mm -hmm, center yeah. of the work of, uh, of social work and, and most of our um, public health and health helping professions, right? Someone uh, self-determination, someone gets to decide, mm -hmm. but it's unjust if the ways in which we engage them or not engage them, right? It's a crime that women, I met with 21 women um, over the course of a few months and I asked them about, have you heard of a, a pill, right? I wasn't even using like the textbook names. I did explain it afterwards. Have you heard of a pill? They were like, no, there's a mm -hmm. pill, what? Right? And every single one of these women without exception were actively trying to not um, um, become exposed, right? Mm -hmm. Every single one of them, um, all of them had had children, all of them had had testing, whether it's um, through pregnancy or in advance or multiple times, and they had never been told of this pill. That is a crime. That's mm -hmm. like social injustice, right? Um, and so in trying to talk with the women, um, A, prevent, providing information and hearing their voices and having their voices, their fingerprint on the intervention, I think it, it, it takes steps towards justice and having them be investigators in the study, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> No, it's um, what you're saying is absolutely, you know, very much on point. And I was just also wondering, like you said, like, you know, folks hadn't heard of it or I didn't know if, if folks had heard of it, there was reticence of taking it. And I didn't know um, just in your work, like the, the role of trauma um, and of other sort of um, what you called like unfortunate historical sort of inequities. Um, had shaped, you know, the work you need to do to get folks to be able to leverage the things that are out there to protect themselves. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, trauma, trauma is definitely uh, determinative, uh, determinative of health, right? Um, mm -hmm. In ways that are both overt and less overt, right? Um, 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 and so in this case of the women I'm talking about in Alabama, they hadn't heard, right? So choice was mm -hmm. um, taken away from them. So I'm actually writing a paper now where I um, have titled it Forced Prepless Sex um, and uh, Forced Condomless Sex, kind of looking at the intersection of um, information um, and um, mm -hmm. system. Uh, and like a dominance that's happening, right? Um, mm -hmm. Both in the macro level and um, in let like in that interest, um, the interaction between a woman and her provider, right? Um, where women are not being told, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. And so agency is not even on the table. Right, because I don't even get to choose or not choose. Right, mm -hmm. women um, um, elsewhere in the country um, who know. Right, so I'm a part of a team with the University of Rochester, um, uh, Yale University, Columbia, and myself from Alabama. I, I started the work while I was still at Columbia, and um, we worked with uh, 206 women who were enrolled in a similar version of the study, but this time we had, we blended two evidence-based interventions. One was the this group that I was telling you about, this intervention that is uh, multimedia, mm -hmm. Intervention is called Women on the Road to Health, um, and it's mm -hmm. delivered in a group format. Uh, the first session is individual, but it blends media. Um, it's beautiful. I'll send you the link just in case you want to see excerpts from it. Mm -hmm. um, um, it blends um, media, but like engagement, and it's delivered by peers. So um, many times women um, from those study learn about it, right? But then there's the question of, um, as you were saying, how trauma impacts, right? Mm -hmm. So um, some women have trauma from the medical provider, right? And trauma, I don't want to overuse the term, 
right? Um, um, but part of what we know is that the level of complexity of trauma in the lives of the women um, that we serve is just incredibly great, right? Mm -hmm. So this particular study, it's called Worth Transition. So it blends mm -hmm. worth and in a transition clinic. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the transition clinic model, but it was born in, uh, out of Yale. And um, they have transition clinics uh, around the country. And basically, it its mission is to work with individuals who are transitioning from um, uh, carceral settings into the community and providing um, a constellation of um, health and medical and behavioral health services, whether directly or through referrals, right, to create like a wraparound care for the population. Mm -hmm. So this intervention, worth transition, blended these two um, models seamlessly. And so in talking to the women, part of what we learn is that um, um, the way we define trauma um, is out of, it's limited in comparison to the experiences, right? So that medical provider relationship can be traumatic, right? Um, um, then there's of course trauma with the uh, carceral settings, there's trauma with the mm -hmm. criminal legal system as a whole, um, and other forms of trauma, which leads to like a mistrust or a distrust of providers, um, which is why for the intervention, the worth intervention, we always have peers deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, because part of what we know is that that voice of the peer is essential, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I just presented, um, at a conference and I was talking about the centrality of the peer um, um, connection. So women, so for example, mm -hmm. we had one uh, moment where a woman said, um, because this, the first session for the worth intervention involves testing for HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. We also tested for HCV, mm -hmm. hepatitis C. Um, and so when we were doing the, the peer, uh, was doing the um, um, HIV test and it was like a finger prick test mm -hmm. um, just to kind of get an initial um, sense of what was happening. The she Before she, the test started, she said, like, what would happen if you found out, you know, you had a, a, a diagnosis of HIV? She said, I would just go out and kill myself. I, I would do I would so much drugs to end my life or something like that. And the peer she was speaking to had been living with HIV for a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, could you tell that I live with HIV? And the young, the woman said, what? You are. And it was just in that moment, it was quite mm -hmm. transformative, right? And so it was um, uh, by having a peer deliver it, we were trying to intentionally um, mitigate some of the um, mistrust that is directed at um, professionals, um, mm -hmm. um, whether that professional has earned it or not, right? Because of histories of trauma with systems. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered your question. It, it did, it was really, it was quite wonderful and just so illustrative of, of how the work that folks can do as leaders, how they can make it innovative and then also speak to the social determinants of that drive inequities um, and um, really can make uh, an Im lasting change, you know, for the innovator, for the folks that you're trying to reach and also for the disciplines in which you operate. So it's just um, really quite lovely and quite inspiring. Um, it was just a, a riveting, your replies were riveting to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Candice, I didn't want to um, yeah, start the conversation. So. I, I, um, I'm just going to have to, you know, echo everything, you know, that Dr. Sursi says, like, um, everything has been very enlightening and, and um, empowering. Yeah. I think, you know, that from the peer, del you know, delivered interventions, um, you know, that you mentioned to the transition clinic set up, you know, for formerly incarcerated individuals. So, so there's so much here and I'm just cognizant of time, you know, as mm -hmm. we can bring the podcast to a close. Um, but Dr. Karen, um, if you had a magic wand, you know, that you could change anything in the work that you do or the areas that you care most about, um, what changes would you make? Yeah, um, I really wish I had that magic wand. Um, I would say maybe circling back to what I just said, um, 
I think we need to do deeper dive um, into the study of trauma and the impact of trauma. <clears throat> um, um, because I think our definitions are limited. And I think what I would do is perhaps create a lab teamed um, with engineers and social workers and public health workers, medical doctors and nurses. Um, and we would um, intensely study trauma um, across mm -hmm. all these intersections, for example, but it wouldn't be the only thing I'd study. <laughs> you know, I was listening to a podcast the other day and it was talking about the impact of trauma on agency and ways through the use of um, kind of external um, devices that we could then um, try to reverse some of that. I think if we could study that more in this unlimited kind of magic one world, um, um, that would make a difference, um, a real difference, because I think we have to, you know, really bring all these professions together in order to do the very thing that I talked about earlier, that if you build it and if it's available, um, everyone would know, and then agency wouldn't be limited by trauma and distress. Like it would be ultimately a woman's kind of free will choice to take or not take it, or a man or a, a, a child, or what you know, um, under the guidance of their parents, but not because um, because of the ill effects of system trauma, historical trauma, race-based trauma, you know, gender trauma and things like that. That's one thing I would do with the magic wand. <laughs> wow. That's wonderful. That, that, that's absolutely awesome. So um, I just know that uh, this has been a fantastic uh, interview. I didn't know if you had any final thoughts at all, uh, Dr. Cersei. No, I just, um, thank you for the work that you do. I mean, that sounds very trite, but it's um, coming from the bottom of my my heart. Um, I know that you're working in a part of the country that is so disparately impacted by HIV um, and that women's health issues overall are, are sometimes not giving the, um, they're kind of giving short shrift, um, you know, um, through multiple mechanisms. But uh, today's talk with you has been so enlightening and so heartening and um, just so admire the way that you are leveraging um, the voices and bringing those, uh, the voices of those um, who are not heard very often, um, giving, them an, giving folks an opportunity and making sure they have a seat at the table. Um, it's just very powerful. So thank you very much for, and for sharing that with us today. I thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. The time went so quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you are very wonderful, very passionate, and eloquent mm -hmm. uh, yeah, speaker. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think this has been yeah, it's flown by for me as well. Um, so thank you everyone for joining in to the Health Innovators to Watch podcast 2023. Mm -hmm. This has been Dr. Karen Johnson, um, and you can see more about her and her work on bcph.org. Follow her on LinkedIn, uh, and we look forward to talking to you next time in our next podcast. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Karen. Thank, Thank you. you so very much. This was wonderful.